Today, we're joined by Stephen McManus, Senior Product Support Specialist. And with that, I'd like to welcome Stephen. Thank you for that introduction. Once again, my name is Steve McManus. I have worked at ISCO for near, nearly 40 years in a variety of positions. Uh, from bench repair technician, I have into, interacted with engineering on a number of projects. I provide sales support and marketing support, which includes providing presentations such as the following that we're doing today. My position at ISCO right now is the Senior Product Support Specialist. And this is the type of activities that my position handles is helping uh, provide education on the variety of projects that products that ISCO has to offer. Teledyne ISCO was established in 1958. We released the first automated wastewater sampler in 1971 and Teledyne ISCO is now the world leader in samplers. Sampling is performed for a variety of needs or purposes. It is used to determine what chemical constituents exist in fluid being sampled, used to determine if those constituents are within safe or regulatory limits. It is used to determine water quality parameters such as BOD, COD, turbidity, pH, DO, and a variety of other parameters. And also to determine if those parameters are within safe or regulatory driven limits. There is research uh, performed for environmental impact. Also to determine what other constituents may exist in that flow, solids, metals, sedimentation runoff from construction sites, et cetera. And this includes pathogens. The COVID impacted has inspired and renewed the interest in tracking pathogens in wastewater. And that is the subject matter for today's presentation, tracking pathogens in wastewater. Wastewater-based epidemiology is simply the use of sample analysis of sewer flow to determine the presence of viruses and other pathogens in sewage flow. This can be a key indicator of the presence and the prevalence of infection within the population that flow originated from. The recently proven ability to accurately detect COVID-19 genetic material in wastewater is prompting rapid development of wastewater monitoring techniques capable of early detection of emerging infection hotspots, often weeks in advance of traditional population testing. The next roughly 40 minutes will be spent covering information related to sampling for pathogens, and that will be followed by a 20 minute Q&A session. Feel free to ask questions using the chat function of Zoom as the presentation is given. If that question relates to the topic at hand, I will answer immediately. I will make every effort to answer all questions submitted during the Q&A session that are not covered during the body of the presentation. You are also welcome to submit questions to me via email if they arise after the webinar is completed as well. So today's agenda, we're gonna talk about what WDS is, also known as WBE sampling, the type of sampling methods and sampler options, as well as recommendations for sampling locations. So what is WBE or WDS? WBE or water-based epidemiology, sometimes referred to as WDS, wastewater-based disease surveillance. It is pre predominant purpose is to detect pathogens for use in public policy decision-making. 
This is a valuable population level approach for monitoring viral pathogens in a population. Similar methods are also used for detection of prevalence of substances such as pharmaceuticals or illicit drugs. This can serve as, can serve as an independent indicator of disease prevalence within a given location. WBE or WDS sampling was initially a pr proposed as a method for tracking disease in the 1940s. However, technology had not quite caught up with the ability to be able to do so adequately. Practical application of this sampling method began to increase in earnest in the early 2000s. In Israel in 2018, it was used to track an outbreak of polio. WBE sampling was effectively used to determine COVID-19 hotspots throughout the world. It is recommended for such sampling that at minimum, there be two samples per location per week to ensure accurate trend analysis. And again, this is used to determine potential issues, what level of health resources and actions are required to address the concern and where those resources should go. There are a variety of methods for collecting samples from whatever source that sample has been collected from. In the olden days, the predominant method for collecting a sample was a manual grab sample, typically done with a bottle strapped to the end of a pole that would then be dipped down into the source to collect that sample. Manual samples are unsanitary due to the increased risk of contact with the sample source and the fluid. They can be time consuming because instead of setting an equipment out to collect those samples automatically on its own, it requires manual labor to go out and visit these sites. Manual samples are undesirable because often there are for many variations that can occur in how that sample is collected. What one person does when they go out to collect that sample may be completely different from person two and person three and on down the line. Therefore, that variability can create some, some measure of uh, you know, unknowns, if you will, and unreliability in that sample that's being analyzed back at the lab. Automated samplers are somewhat of the gold standard for collecting samples for any reason. They're very hygienic. In other words, there's no risk of direct contact with the sample by the person collecting it. It's very quick, you go out, you hook up the sampler, hit the on button, start the program, and you walk away. And you come back the next day to collect up your, your bottles that your sample has been delivered to fairly quick. Auto sampling is more suitable for WE because of the consistency offered by this method of sampling. Now, up front, the cost of an automated sampler may make it appear that this is a more expensive approach, but in reality, there's expenses with sending personnel out to the field as well, and those costs are ongoing. The cost of that sampler is a one-time deal. So in the long run, automated samplers are a more economic approach to collecting samples. Now, an automated sampler consists of several components. You'll have a controller unit, that'll have a microprocessor, program memory, operational software that the user will 
to find how they want that sampler to operate. Most samplers will have a display so that you can evaluate current status or current state of that sampler. There will be a pump that based upon how the user has programmed the unit will operate and collect that sample. Now that sample cycle, initially, the pump will run in reverse to purge the line out and remove any residual fluid that may have migrated up in the line since the last sample event. Of course, this is because the whole goal when that sample is collected, you want that sample that's delivered to the bottle to represent what's in the flow stream at the time that it's collected. You do not want that sample to represent what's been sitting in the line for the last 15 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever your sample frequency is. Once it has purged the line, it will then run forward and pull the sample up and deliver the programmed volume into that bottle. Once the sampler has delivered the amount of sample that has been programmed into the unit, once again, it will run the pump in reverse to purge and clear the line out of all the sample that has been drawn up into that line to deliver that sample. So the line would therefore will be free and clear of any residual fluid and able to be able to deliver the next sample without any cross-contamination from previous samples. Teledyne ISCO has a variety of sample options. We have permanently located refrigerated samplers. They're AC powered. By their very nature, they're not very easy to move around, so they're stationary. Commonly, these are what are found at industrial effluents, influent and effluent of treatment plants, basically places that there's going to be sampling on a more regular day in, day out basis. And that sampler is going to stay there till the end of its life. There are portable sampler options that are used to go around from site to site to be able to collect those one time samples that will be collected at a given location or a series of locations. Maybe it's rotated through. For portable samplers, cooling is often performed by putting ice packs or ice or gel packs in the sample base around the bottles for sample preservation. This is probably the most common sampler option we will find for this method of sampling because what you sample today may not be the location you're going to sample at tomorrow, so you want something that's portable in nature. We do also have portable refrigeration sampler options where that sampler is easily moved around. As you can see, it is on a cart with wheels. But the advantage here is it does have active refrigeration. Unlike that ice, which is going to melt, the portable refrigerated unit will be able to actively cool that sample until it is able to be collected for delivery to the lab. For automated sampling, and again, this is these are portable samplers that we see here. For pathogen sampling, typically one would use a single bottle. A series of samples will be collected over a period of time, typically one day. Oftentimes that pacing will be time paced where they'll just collect a sample every 15 minutes or something of that nature on a regular basis throughout the full 24 hours and the program will consider itself to be done. Samples, again, are collected at user defined intervals. Sample in the bottle represents the composite of all the flow that moved past that location over that sampling period, that 24 hour day. And this is the most sampling, uh, common sampling method used for this purpose. A 
Occasionally, someone may want to perform sequential sampling. And the advantage of a sequential sampler model with its multiple bottles is that now you can track and evaluate how that flow changed over that sampling interval because you can program that unit up to say, collect a sample every 15 minutes and then move to the next bottle every hour. So each bottle represents a, the condition of that flow hour by hour over that day. So one is able to establish the trend of the constituents in that flow over that period of time, because now we have that with each bottle representing an hour of time over that 24 hour period. Again, bottles are switched based upon user defined interval. And each bottle represents the state of the source that we're sampling from for that given time interval that the samples were collected into that bottle. It is also worth noting that we do also have a, another sampling option, the vacuum sampler. However, for the portable sampler application usage, we're talking here, the peristaltic pump is the most appropriate option to select. Now, this is an example of a time-paced program in a multiple bottle sampler, where you can see that in regular intervals, those samples were collected over that period of time based upon how the user has defined those samples to be collected. This would be an example of a flow-paced sampling routine where you can see that the intensity of sample collection is greater when flow is high because we are pacing the sampler based upon flow volume moving past this site over that period of time. This is an example of a time-paced program, but one where we are adjusting the volume delivered to the bottle based upon the flow rate that is occurring at the moment of time that the sample was collected. So as you can see here, when the flow is at the lower levels, the amount of volume in the bottle is less. When the flow is at the greater amount, the bottle is fuller. The difficulty with this is if you do not know what the flow is going to be at that site, it could be very easy to under or overpace that sampler without knowledge of what's going on. So if you design a flow program that's based for a, flow, a lower flow than what actually occurs, you may end up where all the bottles are full to near full rather than being truly flow weighted over that sampling interval. On the other hand, if the flows are well below what you expect them to be, you could have a situation where you have very little to no volume in each bottle throughout the sampling period because we underpaced it. So just be very cognizant when developing a flow paced program. It's important to have an idea of what the expected range of flows as well as those range of flows should be not extremely tight, but within a relative um, small range so that we're able to establish a adequate flow pacing sampling program and hit our target. So selecting our sampling locations, this can fall into a variety of categories. One such application that was actually given birth in a lot of the COVID sampling was specific location sampling, such as buildings for dorms, hospitals, nursing homes, industrial facilities, 
where we're attempting to evaluate and determine the viral concentration and infection prevalence from that specific source. Again, this is often performed with a automatic sample that can be either located at that location over a period of time or from a series of such locations if you have a multiple bottle sampler where you take and carry the portable sampler from site A to site B, collect your sample in that bottle, cap it off, take the sampler and then go to the next location using grab sampling or manual samples into those bottles. It need not be a program that is run to con and taking those samples on an automatic basis, it can be user triggered. But most commonly, if this is going to be a location where we're going to deploy the sampler and leave it there, it will be a single bottle composite scenario that one will often fill the base with ice for sample preservation. But if we're using multiple locations where we're moving throughout the day from site A to site B to C and so forth, some folks will often use one of the portable refrigerated units so they don't have to lug around a base full of ice that is melting and sloshing and risk splashing into bottles. And again, this will often be performed using sequential samplers, a sequential bottle configuration, so that each bottle represents the sample from that given location, and then the next bottle is the next location and on down the line. Again, the frequency for sampling at such locations should be at minimum twice a week because these types of constituents in the flow can change very drastically over a 24 to 48 hour period of time. So if we're performing once a week or once every two weeks, we're not going to get that proper trend analysis that we're after. And again, oftentimes this will be a deployed sampler that remains at that location and is able to select multiple samples over that period of time so that we're able to establish what's going on throughout the day, not just at what happened at two o'clock. Another sampling location would be for you know, neighborhoods or regions within a town, municipality, whatever the size of the population is at that particular area to establish what the prevalence or spread of any given pathogen would be within that community. Again, this is often performed with most commonly a composite sample with an automatic program that's been put in to collect a sample based upon typically time 15 minutes is kind of a good rule of thumb so that you have 96 samples collected over a 24 hour period from that location. Again, sample preservation will often be performed by placing ice or gel packs into that base. And again, the frequency, the sampling should be for a full 24 hour period of time the volume that is delivered would depend upon a number of factors, but typically the idea is to fill that composite bottle. So if you do the math, if you have a 10 liter bottle and you're collecting 96 samples over that period of time, you know, setting that volume per sample somewhere in that 80 milliliter to 90 milliliter range will guarantee that you have adequate volume in the bottle when you go to collect it the next day. Another location that would be utilized for this type of sampling need would be at the influent to a treatment plant or a catchment area where there's a large, uh, larger area of samples being delivered to this single location. And the purpose of here would be to you know, determine what is the 
the citywide community spread, get an idea of what the prevalence is within the overall population of that city or the residential areas, industrial areas that are served by that given treatment plan. Again, this is commonly composite, but it can also be sequential sampling if the desire is to establish what the trend is over that 24 hour period of time, rather than just having one lump sum evaluation. Again, this can be time paced, but often at treatment plants, there are flow meters present and there is an idea of what typical flows are gonna be at that particular facility. And therefore the opportunity to adequately flow pace a sample is open to us. Typically, this will be a permanently mounted refrigerated sampler because at the treatment plant, you're not going to be you know, picking up that refrigerator and moving it. It's going to be sampling 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, 356 days on that one special year every four. And that's going to be an ongoing thing. So typically, this will be the stationary permanently mounted refrigerated sampler. Again, the frequency of, of doing time paste that will typically be at a 15 minute rate for 24 hours. But if we're doing flow paste, again, that's gonna be developed based upon what the expected range of flows are going to be at that given location. And my typical approach for you know, programming a sampler in such an application is to devise the program such that if I have an average flow day, my bottle is 80% full. That will guarantee that if I have a below flow day, I more than likely have an adequate amount of sample to deliver to the lab for analysis. But if I have an above average flow day, I have some room, some headspace in the bottle to collect more samples on those days. For sample handling, this is a very important point to make. Uh, and I always recommend that you confer with whoever you're utilizing for your analysis and get their input on what decontamination procedures should be used for the bottle, for the tubing. Make sure what materials are acceptable for use and which materials should be avoided for certain sampling application needs, certain constituents that the sample could come into contact with could compromise the integrity of that analysis. So just for example, if we're sampling for metals, we would not want to have any metal in the tra sample transport path from the source to the sample bottle because that could result in artificially inflating the presence of metal when that sample is analyzed. So be very cognizant of why you're sampling and what can lead towards high integrity sample analysis and compromised integrity. Confer with the laboratory about what pre preservation methods that they prefer to have based upon their analysis procedures. Make sure everyone that's going to be collecting samples, setting up the sampler itself, taking out the empty bottles, you know, performing maintenance on the sampler on occasions such as tubing replacement, et cetera, et cetera. Make sure everyone understands the handling procedures of those particular components to ensure again that we are not compromising our sample integrity. Make sure everybody does the same procedures. For storage requirements of that sampler, a sample that's been collected as it's being you know, collected from the sample in the field, brought back to the you know, main office for then delivery to the analytical laboratory, make sure that those storage requirements of that sampler are all followed according to what the laboratory dictates. 
certain sample analysis has a time limit on how long one can go from the point in time the sample was collected before that sample degrades and is no longer in a state that one is able to take and understand what the constituents or get out of the, the sample what they're after. So be very cognizant of what those time limits are for sample holding. The most important thing to take to heart and make as the golden rule for any sampling is that that sample, when it's delivered to the laboratory, must re represent the state it was in when it was collected. So every effort must be made to make sure that the preservation of that sample integrity is done. Do not do things like collect the sample, put it in the back of your van or your truck, and then go in the middle of a hot day and leave your, your vehicle sit out in the parking lot while you have lunch for an hour and your vehicle is getting up to 120, 130 degrees. That is going to compromise the integrity of that sample. So make sure that every effort is taken to preserve the quality of that sample. Now for safety practices, uh, obviously follow the CDC and OSHA guidelines when handling wastewater. And there are a couple links up there that can be utilized to gather some of those guidelines. But generally speaking, just follow normal practices. You know, make sure that you wear gloves so that you have no risk of skin contact with that sample. Maybe masks should be worn. Uh, again, depending upon what you're sampling for or what the constituents are in the sample you're collecting. Um, if, if you're in a you know, area that could have some ans unsanitary conditions on the ground when you're walking around boots, maybe even PPE would be a, uh, a, a needed and desired you know, safety practice to have, especially for example, if one is going down into manholes to collect the sampler and the collected samples. If you are entering a manhole, make sure that we have adequate ventilation to remove any dangerous elements from the air quality within the manhole. Also have an air quality monitor that allows you to establish, is it safe to go down in that manhole? A wench to raise and lower individuals into the manhole along with the harness and again, PPE. And with that, I invite you to um, submit any questions that you may have at this moment in time. And I welcome anything that uh, you may have to ask and I'll give you the best effort I can to provide the answer. And before we dive into those questions, I'd like to thank you for your attendance today. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to spend this time with us so that we all have the ability to discuss this very important topic. Again, submit any questions you may have via the chat function. My email address is stephen.mcmanus at teledyne.com. We also have a staff of individuals that are able to answer any questions that you may have. And the group email for that department is isco water support at teledyne.com. You are welcome to call us at 1 866 298 6174. And with that, let's get into the questions. And once again, thank you, everybody. Um, I've got my first question here. Could you speak of examples of using auto samplers in local sewers? Are those auto samplers placed within the manhole access shaft? The answer is yes. Typically um, in a manhole environment, uh, oftentimes those access points are in the middle of the street. So you can't set the sampler up in the middle of the road and run the tubing down. So what individuals will do and the samplers are designed for 
with the intention of being lowered into the manhole shaft. There will be some um, hanging mechanism and a harness to suspend the sampler below the manhole lid so it can be closed. And then with the individuals that are servicing the sampler and collecting the samples that have been collected, what they will do is go out, pop the manhole lid off, pull the sampler up from its suspension harness, and then do the work they need to do to uh, remove the sample bottles that have sample in them, often replenish that sampler base with empty bottles in if, if they're performing cooling preservation with ice or gel packs, they'll swap those out at the same time, re-lower and re-hang the sampler into the manhole shaft after starting the program. And they'll walk away until they come back the next day to pick up those collected samples. Oftentimes, a lot of the, the sample techniques are kind of generic in, in nature and they will cover a wide variety of sample needs. The biggest things that come in to, that are specific for certain specific sampling purposes, such as when you're sampling for pathogens or when you're sampling for BOD or chemical constituents, um, COD, solids, that's where there will be some uniqueness for that sampler purpose. But generally speaking, a lot of the sampler techniques and activities will be the same. There's a question here that we've received about upgrading the type of batteries available to the samplers. Sometimes we've used the nickel cadmium batteries provided with rentals and they have a relatively short or lower charge. That is correct. Um, NICAD batteries do have a lower amp hour capacity rating compared to other battery options. The positive side is the NICAD batteries are kind of like the Timex of batteries. They can take a beating and they will last a very long time without requiring a great degree of tender loving care. Other battery options out there in the market, um, such as a lead acid battery, uh, will have greater capacity, but there is, on the other side of that coin, there is need for greater care in avoiding, um, you know, deep discharging of the battery, uh, avoiding um, the battery sitting in a discharge state for prolonged periods of time, because that can and will harm the battery as life goes on, and you will have a shorter uh, lifespan of that battery as a result. So if you do have an application need where maybe it's gonna to need to be deployed remotely, not able to be accessible on a you know, regular basis, and therefore you need to have a battery that has more you know, firepower, if you will, more capacity, uh, maybe look at other alternative options like a, a marine battery, or even in some cases, uh, where they, you have a remote location that's more permanent in nature, folks will use a marine battery coupled with the solar panel system. And then also always be very cognizant of your battery capacity when you're programming the sampler, um, because you can do some things there to either work in your favor or work against it. If you have, are doing too frequent of sampling and then running the pump much more and more often um, and thus using uh, more battery power. So maybe take larger volume samples, but run the sampler less frequent to compensate. Question here about any specific advice to minimize strain or blocking with debris. Um, well, first of all, uh, each application is a little bit unique. Uh, and there is going to be maybe a, a learning curve at each given location. Some locations have, will have a greater um, you know, risk of having a blockage or restriction as a result of debris building up than others. And the thing to do there, for example, if you have an application where there is a, a, a greater amount of solids and debris that can place that, that intake at risk of a restriction or a blockage, 
course, this somewhat depends upon what the depths are in that particular pipe or that channel. You can mount the strainer up the side of the pipe a little bit so it's not at the bottom where a lot of that debris is being skirted along so that it's not going to be in the path and, uh, of that debris and therefore we're reducing the risk of any blockages or restriction just by how and where we mount that sensor. Put the sensor, or, or not the sensor, the strainer. Put the strainer in a location where you have a little, you know, more mixing, you know, you want to avoid placing that intake in an area where there's more stagnant conditions. Because again, as I indicated in the body of the presentation, we want that sample that's delivered to the bottle to be representative of what's flowing in that channel. And if you've got a, you know, like a, a little vault or of some sort, uh, or like a wet well, and you're not pla placing that intake in an area where there's more newer fluid being introduced on a regular basis, you're going to be getting inaccurate or results that may not represent what's really going on. In extreme conditions um, where you have a lot of debris, um, there are folks that will have, you know, created, manufactured, utilized a debris deflector, uh, something like a, well, like a ramp or a cone that's out in front of the strainer that diverts debris around the intake and thus mi minimizes the risk of anything building up on the intake. Okay. There's a question here about, do you have any plans to build into your current charges a timer option? Well, a lot of this happens to depend upon what type of batteries we're utilizing. Uh, for example, if you're utilizing NICAD batteries, even though it takes 16 hours to charge that battery up, uh, as long as the, the battery's in an, uh, an area where there's adequate ventilation to dissipate heat, it doesn't really create any situation of harm, you know, risk for the battery if it's left on the charger for 18 or 20 or even 24 hours. The, uh, the lead acid battery, on the other hand, does have a requirement uh, uh, and can be overcharged, which comes back to the type of charger that's being utilized if you know, properly selected. If you're using a lead acid battery, get the lead acid chargers, and what the lead acid charger will do is as the state of charge in the battery reaches and approaches 100%, the charge that's delivered from the charger begins to reduce and it eliminates the risk of overcharging the battery. If you have a lead acid battery on a lead acid uh, with a lead acid charger and that battery has reached 100% charge, the output from the charge is in a state of a trickle charge and it will not place the battery at risk. Any other questions? Um, again, I'll uh, just uh, put it back out there. My email address is stephen.mcmanus at teledyne.com. And if you have any questions that do pop into your head, you know, today, tomorrow, next week, you're more than welcome to send me those questions via email. I will be more than happy to answer any questions that are submitted.